Alright, today is Monday, the 2nd of September. Happy Labor Day. I hope you're all enjoying the weekend, uh, rested, relaxed, and ready to get smacked in the face this upcoming week. But this is a recap for the stock market activities for the week that was, and an outlook for the week to come. And folks, I got a good one for you tonight. You know what's really interesting about this weekend uh, here in the city of Las Vegas? It was absolute chaos and insanity because we were hosting this uh, college football game between USC and LSU. And I'm pretty sure a lot of you were in town to watch the game. I hope you had a great time and uh, you didn't get your balls stung by a scorpion in the five-star resort. Talk about a Las Vegas souvenir you want to take home. Swollen balls. Try to explain that when you get back home. But you know, when I found out that uh, USC is playing LSU, my first thought was, f*** USC. Because I used to go to UCLA, the rival. And we used to think, uh, I mean, we still kind of think of USC kids as the rich kids. We despised them. But I must confess, I used to go to parties in USC uh, because the plan at the time was, I'm going to meet uh, some rich somebody's daughter, get married, and be set for life. And of course, that plan didn't work out, to say the least. So here we are, we're doing the show right now. But of course, once I found out that the game is taking place, I had to bet against USC. And I lost money. USC? That spread could have opened at 18, f***ing top 10 team. So you know what? I'm going to say, forget about college ball. Let's stick to the stock market. Because this week was easy. I mean, I shared the trades with you all week. Uh, made about a little under 70 grand in less than a week. Because the garbage that they gave us this week was so easy to spot. At least in the last couple of days, what they do is they paint the tape in the morning. Meaning they pump the stock market higher in the pre-session. Then we open higher. What happens is we fade. Midday, early in the day, we see a big fade. And this was consistent in the last, let's say, couple of days or so. So there was an easy trade to take right off the gate, which is fading the rip in the pre-market. And then comes uh, the end of the day and you get the pump. So you, you take a short in the morning, you take a ride higher. At the end of the day, if you trade that correctly, you made a lot of money. Even though it was a stupid week. I mean, the market was flattish all in all. Nothing happened. Uh, low volume. But uh, we had one event, which is NVIDIA's earnings. And it didn't come out as fireworks. But there is a take. An important take that we have to discuss from NVIDIA's earnings. Guess what though? We're heading into the month of September. Once Labor Day is out of the way, the traders, the betters, the gamblers, the degenerates alike, they're all coming back to play. Forget about the casinos and football. We're talking about the stock market here, the big casino. But what usually happens, everybody been on vacation, spent a lot of money on travel, on booze and food and God knows what else. And now you're kind of running low. So you open your stock market portfolio, you're up for the year, and you say, you know what, let's take some money out. Because now I'm feeling that I'm a little poor, but I'm rich on paper. And that's, in essence, the September effect. And this is why usually September is a bad month for the stock market. But this week, we have an important uh, little thingy here that we got to talk about, which is Friday's payrolls. You got to remember that the chaos that began in the early part of August, the catalyst for that was the payrolls. It wasn't the Japanese yen. The payrolls moved the dollar down. And because the dollar moved down, the Japanese yen went higher, causing the massive uh, margin called tsunami. And if the payrolls this Friday come out as a confirmation of the previous payrolls, oh boy, buckle up your seatbelts. What if the payrolls come out hot though? Because it is cooking season after all. It's the election season. They cooked the retail sales data. They cooked the, the jobless claims. They cooked a lot of other pieces of data. The GDP, <laughs> that was a beauty this week. But there was a catch. If it comes out hot, the market will get upset again for another reason. So let's talk about this and a lot more, folks. And we begin, per usual, the wall of hope. In the wall of hope, we have the rate cuts or no rate cuts, depending on what the circumstances is, what the market mood is. We'll talk about that in details in a minute. But we also have the AI hype. Let's begin with the Federal Reserve's policy, which is rate cuts. When the initial shock happened early in August, the market threw a fit, even though we already knew that rate cuts are coming and they're coming for the wrong reasons. So shouldn't we jerk off when we had the bad pay payrolls report? Wasn't that a validation that the rate cuts are coming in a big way? Shouldn't we be happy about that? Oh no, the market now doesn't like it because the market now realizes that the rate cuts are happening for the wrong reasons. So the market took solace 
in cake number one, and this is the battle of the cakes to understand the whole rate cut dynamics in terms of psychology. And cake number one says, you know what? Maybe we're not going to have rate cuts because there is no recession. And the payrolls, that's the anomaly. That's the exception. Then little by little by little, the market began to realize after digestion, the market began to accept the reality that sure rate cuts are happening they're happening for the wrong reason the recession risk is real but the market found out another cake another bargaining chip which is okay you know what if the <laughs> If there is a recession or a threat of a recession, the Fed will take care of it because the Fed will be aggressive. They will cut. If they need 50, they'll do 50. 75, they'll do 75. 100, they'll do it and cut rates. And all of a sudden became sort of a Goldilocks scenario for the market where you can look at these two hopes. If one day you get a bad piece of data, you say, okay, well, you know what? The Fed is going to take care of it. If you get a good piece of data, you say, you know what? There's no rate cuts anymore. No need for them because the economy is not heading into a recession. All of a sudden, the market has its cakes, not cake, cakes, and eating it too. The problem is one of these two cakes will disappear. And that's when reality strikes in a very negative way for the market. But we know which cake is going to disappear. It's just a matter of time. It's cake number one. No rate cuts because there is no recession. Well, if you continue to get recession data, at some point you got to succumb to the reality that no, we have rate cuts. And it's going to be for the wrong reasons. And that's going to unlock the recession psychology, which we talked about in details last week. The more thing. Meaning that if the market was looking for 25, now it wants 50. If it's 50, now the market wants 75. If it's 75, it wants 100. And it keeps going and going. Nothing will be satisfying to the market. That's when the game ends. And this is why the payrolls this Friday will be extremely important. Because if the payrolls come out weak, there'll be confirmation that uh, cake number one is gone. And it's going to be a negative for the market. If the payrolls come out hard, though, then cake number two will be gone, at least for now. And I don't think the market will be happy about that the market wants both options both fantasies to stay alive but let's talk about which pieces of evidence that we gotten so far supporting uh, each cake we talk about cake number one no rate cuts because there is no recession it began with the services ism we kind of predicted this in this channel right here we said look we're gonna get the services ism pmi doesn't matter which one look at it's going to show that the services sector of the economy is actually doing pretty good it's not in a recession yet because we have the ic heart phenomenon in the economy and that's going to cause a boost for the market even though at the time a lot of folks were saying oh we're going to crash yada 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 it was actually the bulls who were saying that so we know it was bullshit by the way the pumpers were saying we're going to crash but then came the services pmi and it gave the market a renewed source of hope we got initial jobless claims whether that's fugazi or not, it pumped the market higher. You guys remember, we got a reversal Wednesday. We're going to go down again, revisit the lows. Then comes initial jobless claims, and we're back on track in the rebound. Then came retail sales. That was a big one in pushing the market higher. And the latest one is GDP. Now, we got to remember something here. We are amidst the election season, aka the funny season, and a lot of cooking is happening. And I think they're going to revise retail sales down. They're going to revise the GDP down. They do that all the time. And we'll see cake number one disappear. What pieces of evidence support cake number two? Well, we got the July payrolls. That was uh, the source of the freak out, the shock. And then the eventual birth of cake number two. We got the manufacturing PMI. That was really weak. Construction spending and many other pieces of data. But this week alone, or shall we say the week that was, we got pending home sales, look at this, below the pandemic crash of 2020, when everybody was locked in. The end of the world, right? The great panic. We're even below that. So there is a huge problem happening in the housing market right now. We also got some earnings from uh, retail companies, the latest being Dollar General. And uh, the stock went down by more than 30%. The latest stock that loses over 30% of its value in a single day. Why? Because... The consumer is getting weaker. You got Lululemon cutting guidance, missing sales, talking about consumer weakness. You got Ulta Beauty also trimming the guidance. Many companies have been cutting guidance, saying that the consumer is weaker. We expect lower sales. Where is this weakness coming from? Again, we have the icy hot phenomenon in the economy. This is the most unequal economy 
in the history of the nation. That's Bidenomics, they say. But because we have, uh, by the way, I'm joking, it's not Bidenomics that gave us the most unequal uh, economy ever. It certainly contributed to it, but it's been years and years of misguided policy by the Federal Reserve that caused the most unequal economy in the history of this nation. So things are not impacted equally. And right now, with the rise of inflation and higher rates, which type of consumer that is getting damaged at least right now, annihilated, I should say. Forget about damaged, annihilated. That's the lower end consumer. When we talk about damaged, who's getting damaged? We can talk about lower middle income, even middle income now getting damaged. And little by little by little, the recession boogeyman climbs up the ladder of income from the poor all the way to the affluent consumer. But there is an important phenomenon that we've been talking about for a while. When you look at a store like Dollar General, who's the consumer? It's the lower income consumer. And if the company is facing sticky inflation, but the lower end consumer is now out of stimmies, out of savings, drowned in credit card debt and delinquencies, then they're getting weaker. They can't spend anymore. And the company's margins get damaged dramatically because there is no replacement. The economy is not weak enough. We're not in a recession yet, at least officially, where we see the middle income consumer broke enough to shop at Dollar General. That's going to happen after they officially announce the recession. And that's going to happen after the unemployment rate skyrockets. Then Dollar General, Dollar Tree will be good uh, stocks to buy. Yet when we talk about other businesses, and you can see the contrast right here. Dollar Tree, Dollar General collapsing, but you have Walmart thriving. Why is Walmart thriving? Because you have the upper middle income consumer rotating and shopping at Walmart looking for deals because they're getting squeezed too. But they have the option, instead of shopping at a fancy store, they can shop at Walmart and save some money. The lower end consumer doesn't have that luxury. If they cannot afford Dollar General, they can't really downgrade. Uh, what are you going to buy? You're going to go to the trash can and shop over there? What are you going to do? So stores where we see consumers rotating down to, those are thriving. And by the way, in this channel, yet again, we've predicted all of this. When we talked about stores like TJ Maxx, stores like Ross. They didn't talk about Walmart. We forgot about that, missed that. But we talked about TJ Maxx and Ross stores. What you're looking at right now, in white, is the XRT, the retail ETF. Let's go back three months ago. From that point on till today, the XRT is up about 6%. But it's being outperformed by Ross up about a little over 16%. TG Maxx in red, up almost 25%. And of course, Walmart, up 30%. Now, at some point, as the economy gets hotter and hotter, even these stores will get hit because the consumer will have to cut spending altogether. Now, it's the stage of, okay, let's downgrade. If I cannot afford Nordstrom, if I cannot afford Macy's, I'm going to shop at TG Maxx or Ross. But the next step will be, I cannot even afford TG Maxx or Ross. I'm going to stay home. But that would be already after the fact because the recession will be already in and rolling in the economy. So again, when we go to the battle of the cakes, we have supporting evidence for both, and the market is happy with that dynamic. But this week, the payrolls could change everything. They could give one cake the advantage over the other, and the market is going to be upset if both options are not available, which is again a fantasy, it's uh, the road to impossible. You're going to lose one of them, and the market will be upset when it loses one of them. Now let's go back to the wall of hope, because we still have AI, and we have an important update. NVIDIA's earnings were out, and the stack went down. Now, you got to understand that sentiment plays a big role in all of this. And before the top in NVIDIA in the month of June, here are some of the headlines. NVIDIA stock packs 50% more upside, says Wall Street new biggest bull. Bull crap, that is. Here's another one headline for you, June 23rd, 24. NVIDIA sales grow so fast that Wall Street cannot keep up. They're talking about the so-called analysts rushing to upgrade NVIDIA and upgrade the price target. They're useless sheep. Would have been nice if they told us all of this back in 22 or early 23. But they're always Johnny come lately, just chasing whatever already happened. And fast forward a quarter or two from now, when NVIDIA is down 40%, they're going to begin cutting uh, targets and downgrading NVIDIA always after the fact. But the sentiment was absolutely insane before the top in NVIDIA and also was the best price to sales. It was exactly at the same peak that we've gotten back in 22 when the stock went down. And what do we see right now? Here's the headline for you. The dumb money poured into NVIDIA ahead of its results. It could have been worse. Dumb money meaning retail investors. The retail investors are buying NVIDIA hand over fist right now. And the pimps... 
the dog analysts, they're all out there on the orders of whoever pays them, the hedge funds, investment firms, NVIDIA, whoever pays, they go out there and upgrade and uh, create any kind of clownish headlines to lure retail investors, aka dumb money, into buying so the insiders can sell. Take, for example, this headline right here. NVIDIA will grow to a $10 trillion company and the Blackwell chip will be like fireworks. The stock. Well, a $10 trillion company, that requires at least annual sales of $500 billion. Even Apple is not doing that, but it doesn't matter. You can have whatever clownish headline you want on the bullish side. You can say that NVIDIA will be a $20 trillion company. Nobody will question your sanity. But if you create any bearish headline, such as NVIDIA is going to crash by 50%, or you're crazy, we don't want to listen to you anymore. Shut them off. You're not going to be on CNBC anymore. But again, as the dumb money is pouring in, the insiders have been dumping. We talked about Soros. We talked about Drunken Miller. We talked about all of these investors who are dumping NVIDIA. Including, by the way, the CEO, Jensen Huan, dumping over $120 million worth of shares right before earnings. And all of the insiders have been on a dumping spree in NVIDIA. At the same time, when this report came out, they announced a $50 billion share buyback. Now, in the old days, the SEC, the regulators, would investigate this. Wait a minute, the CEO, the insiders are dumping, but they're using the company's money. $50 billion worth to buy the stock at insane valuations. What is the reason behind that? Oh, to keep the stock high enough so the insiders can cash out. That's what it's really all about. Now, the problem with NVIDIA, the earnings report that we got, there's nothing wrong with it. When you look at it from face value, the growth is astronomical. The problem that NVIDIA is running into, and we talked about this in details before, months ago, at some point, we're going to run into the low of large numbers, and the stock market appreciates growth in sales or profits. And when the stock was underpricing, the magnitude of the growth in the rate of sales, that was the opportunity. But now, the stock is already pricing in a rosy story. And guess what happened? Here's the rate of growth in sales. You can see it began in Q2 23, 101.5% almost year on year. Then it went as high as 265% growth rate year on year. Now we're down to 122, meaning we've already peaked in NVIDIA. Is 122% a bad number? Absolutely not. But the problem is, what about the next number? You think we'll do 200% year on year again? We run into Q3 numbers from 23? Of course not. But the next report, the growth of sales will be what? 80% if we're lucky? 60% if we have weakness and folks canceling orders? Maybe less than that? And that's what the market is going to try to price in from this point on. But the peak is already behind us. What would that do to the AI element in the wall of hope? It is still alive. It's not dead. It's just peaking right now. And even within the AI mania, we're probably going to see a rotational element. So look, for example, at what you're looking at right now, the SMH in white, that's the chip ETF. But we go back since the top in July. The ETF is down about 13.5%. But then you look at HACK. This is the cybersecurity ETF in red. That's positive by more than 4%. Then you look at the IGV, the software ETF, and that's flattish. That's not down. What is the take here? The question about AI right now will be, show me the efficiency. Show me some results because you guys have been hyping it, this AI thing, and all what we see is just spending, spending, spending by the big companies. Where are the results? Is it just a, a cute gimmick where you ask a question and it comes out with, with an answer? Seven times out of 10, it's the wrong answer. How is that going to grow the revenue of the company? And that's why the big caps... And the chip manufacturers and designers will take the backseat. But companies in the software sector, in the cybersecurity sector, it'll be easier for them to show AI results by increasing efficiency, by creating tools to their customers to make the product more useful. And that's going to lead to growth. So right now in the AI mania, I'm favoring hack, cybersecurity, and IGV software over the big camps and over the semiconductor names. Now let's segue to the wall of worry. It wasn't really active this week, but it's gonna. But we begin, of course, from Washington, D.C., the policy. What is the policy risk right now? It is the insane plan by Kamala Harris of over 40% in capital gains taxes. That's going to crash the market, guaranteed. And even crazier, the taxation of unrealized gains. What do you think that's going to do to the, the stock market if the if the billionaires figure out they're going to get taxed for gains they haven't booked yet, it'll be cheaper for them to book those gains and crash the entire economy. 
The reason why the market is not freaked out about this right now, and you might have seen my video that I produced last week with uh, Fredo, he used to work for CNN, and then he came to the DNC and spit some knowledge. He looked at this, uh, the, the, the VIP section of the DNC. He said, really, she's going to regulate those people who are paying her a million dollars a piece to be at the DNC? Come on. So right now, there is a degree of skepticism. that This could be just a policy to generate headlines, maybe win some voters, but it's not going to be really implemented. And right now, here's the headline for you. Donors urge Kamala Harris to ditch a proposed tax on ultra-wealthy Americans. So right now, they're just talking to her. Look, this is crazy. You know it. We know it. You're not going to do it. But as it becomes reality, as we get closer to the elections, and if Kamala's leading, then the market will begin to price that risk and the donors will begin to price that risk by dumping their equities. I mean, you look at the total assets in money market funds right now, reaching over $6 trillion. And I've been hearing the bullshit from the perma pumpers since last year. Oh, you wait till uh, all of these trillions come out of uh, money market funds to chase the equities market. Are we going to blast higher? Bullshit. Why would I take my money from a money market fund? I'm sitting here risk-free and I'm getting more returns than I ever got in the last few decades. And if you're going to say to me that you're going to tax unrealized gains and capital gains by more than 40%, no thanks. I'm staying with the money market funds right now, happy with my assets being in money market funds. Now, when the shit hits the fan and the Fed begins cutting rates aggressively, sure, then the money rotates back to the market after the fact, after the crash. Back to the wall of worry that leads us, of course, to the election risk. Now, last week, we talked about the possibility of uh, Trump making a comeback. Maybe a little bit, but we haven't seen it this week. Matter of fact, the polls are not good for the orange man right now. If you look at the uh, swing states, that's what really matters. This is from Bloomberg. And Harris is up in Georgia. She's up in Nevada, up in Pennsylvania, by four points, by the way. Dead heat in Arizona, up in Michigan, up in North Carolina by two points, and up in Wisconsin by eight points. Now, you might say, but this poll is not really accurate. Maybe it's a little biased. Sure. Let's look at another one here. This one comes from uh, Harris. You think they'll be biased, right? The hell, Harris? Anyways, you see in Arizona, Trump is winning. Yeah. But in Georgia, supposed to be a reliable Republican state, Harris is up. She's up in Michigan, Nevada, North Carolina, down just by a point, dead heat in Pennsylvania, and down by a point in Wisconsin. And I say, look, if if she's up in Georgia, forget about Trump winning Pennsylvania or Wisconsin or Michigan. Not going to happen. If he cannot secure Georgia, not going to happen. The Midwest, not going to happen. So far, no bump for Trump in the polls, which means that the debate coming out really soon, the debate will be critical because we will know the result of the election right after the debate. The polls will come out. I think those polls are going to stick all the way till November. Absent of an October surprise, as they say, the debate will seal the deal. And if it is indeed Kamala that's going to come out uh, victorious from the debate, then the market will take the policy risk more seriously. The insane capital gains taxes and the unrealized gains taxes, all of that will be taken seriously by the market and the participants in the market. If Trump wins from the debate and he begins to uh, gain traction at the polls, then you'll see the market pricing that risk with perhaps energy going down since he's promising that he's going to permit more drilling. You're going to see Chinese stocks going down. You'll see an impact, but that's going to happen after the debate because right now we're so close to the debate. Might as well just wait for it before we see the polls changing. Now, when it comes to the stock market, uh, at least right now, we talked about Truth Media last week that maybe there's a possibility for a rebound if we get a rebound in Trump polls numbers. Didn't happen this week. The stock actually dived down. But we see the executives dumping. If the debate comes out and Trump is not ahead, he's going to exit immediately from that stock and we will see a big crash. What would that do to the investors who bought the stock knowing it's garbage, but they bought it to show support to the nominee? What happens if they take the short end of the stick? I think that could be a political issue before November or Kamala Harris can use that against Trump. Look at what he did to his own investors. What do you think he's going to do to you? So we got a lot of things when it comes to the election risk to look forward to. But back to the wall of worry. What about geopolitics? We're not talking about this anymore. It seems that the response by Hezbollah was lame and there was no response by Iran, at least not yet. And I think a lot of folks are thinking maybe it's a bluff. It's not going to happen. And there are talks behind the scene between the U.S. administration and Iran not to do the strike before the elections. Who knows? 
But we have a new dynamic that happened yesterday when it comes to the geopolitics re the Middle East. Here's the headline from NBC News. Have the hostage death pushed Israel to the breaking point? Question mark. My answer is I think so. I think this is a big deal because it is the first time since the war began where we see the Prime Minister Netanyahu defeated. So far he's been winning. He's been doing all of this destruction in Gaza. Nobody really held them accountable. He got away with it. He got to free some hostages by force, proving maybe that his approach is the right one. He came here to Congress, and your whore politicians, of course, your beloved politicians, stood up and clapped for him like a bunch of Sea Ward seals. This is the first time since the war began when we see him defeated. And it could prompt a major change in Israel, either by, let's say, a coup by the military, or it could be a huge wave of protests and strikes that paralyzes the economy, and he's forced to resign. The question now becomes, what are the implications on the U.S. elections? Suppose he goes down, and would Trump use that as a card against Kamala Harris? Would that impact the support, at least some of the support that Harris enjoys right now? They migrate to Trump. So it ties in together, folks. Whatever the outcome is the market will begin to price that in. But we know that at least when it comes to individual stocks right now, whatever chaos we're seeing right now, all of this is good for the defense manufacturers. You look at stocks like Lockheed and Raytheon, they just can't stop. They keep going higher and higher and higher. We will talk about some unusual activities that we got on Friday on Lockheed Martin, but what about the other front, the Russia-Ukraine front? I think that Ukraine took a major gamble that could backfire in a big way. And it might be a big defeat. You look at the headline from the Washington Post. So this is the CIA. This is not me saying this. It reads, Ukraine's gamble in Russia has yet to slow Moscow's eastern assault, meaning that Moscow is still advancing in Ukraine. See, the Ukrainians thought that if they invade Russia, it might be a bargaining tool where, hey, I give you your, your land back, you give me mine back, or we can figure out some sort of a deal. But it ain't working so far. It appears that the opposite is happening. Even Forbes magazine says if Ukraine's invasion of Russia, Kursk, was a divergent, it has failed. Russian troops continue to march into a uh, whatever the hell that is. That's in Ukraine, of course. Again from the Washington Post, says Ukraine's offensive derailed secret efforts for partial ceasefire with Russia. What if the Russians score a major victory between now and November? As in the Ukrainian invasion defeated, and now they lost a lot of manpower, it backfires on them, and we see Russia gaining more territory in Ukraine. Would Trump use that as a card or an argument against Harris? Would that impact her numbers at the polls? And again, all of that is going to factor in and how the market prices in the outcome of the elections. Not to mention, of course, when we talk about the geopolitics, what's going on in the Red Sea right now? So the Houthis, they're not uh, done yet. The latest, of course, they blew up a uh, Greek oil tanker. Some talks about an oil spill, perhaps. But again, it's a warning sign that what's going on in the Red Sea hasn't stopped. And shipping rates are still going higher. And I've showed you the correlation between the PPI and shipping rates. Shipping rates, leading indicator to the PPI going higher. Now, I know we haven't been talking about inflation as a risk right now, because the predominant risk is recession. But that inflation risk will come back after the rate cuts. And shipping rates could be a leading indicator to that. Oh, by the way, I don't know if you saw this headline or not. It reads, the U.S. Navy carrier a strike group and a few other warships fired 1.16 billion dollars in weapons battling the Houthis in the Red Sea. Well, how's that working so far when they're still blowing up oil tankers? We just use 1.16 billion dollars worth of expensive fireworks. Well, guess who's gonna replace that 1.16 billion dollars worth of expensive fireworks? It's Raytheon. More and more money to the defense contractors. Let's go back to the wall of worry. We got China. You can't forget about China. And the problem with China is the economy. We've been waiting and waiting and waiting that uh, the stagnant economy of China will find some renewed source of, gro source of growth. Didn't happen so far. And the latest estimate by economists that uh, China will miss the growth target in 24. Furthermore, when we look at factory activities in China, they've been slumping. And we know that China is a factory of the world. So if we have orders in China, factory orders slumping, what does that say about the health of the global economy and the picture of demand in the global economy? And then there's the risk of individual Chinese companies impacting individual U.S. companies. Let's take it one step at a time. You might have noticed this week the stock of Pindudu crashed. The headline reads, China fast fashion retailer Timo soared like a rocket for two years. In just a few hours, 
Its parent company lost more than $50 billion in market value. And here's the chart for you. Huge crash in a short amount of time, losing almost 40% of value in, in just a couple of days. I think what we've learned in the month of August, that things can go higher and it seems that they're going to go higher forever and uh, everything is insane and doesn't make sense and all of that. But boy, when these crashes happen, they happen rapidly. They just take away months worth of gains in days and that's a warning sign but you might say hey maverick what do i care about a chinese company going down 50 60 percent who cares here's why we care this is the headline from the new york times big american tech profits from chinese ad spending spree what are we talking about here when we look at the revenue this is meta's china revenue meta doesn't have any operations in china but they have advertising revenue coming from chinese companies and look at the massive gain between 20 23. We know that Meta stock crashed in 22. It came back partially because of this. Because one Chinese company, Pindudu, spending billions and billions of dollars worth of ads in Meta. Well, if the stock, the parent of that company, Timo, goes down by 40%. And oh, by the way, the growth of Timo in the US has already plateaued. There's no point of spending more on ads. If the company cuts its ad spending, what do you think will happen to Meta and Google? Where these ads have been uh, pretty much all over the place in these two platforms. I think they're going to lose a lot of ground. And that's a warning sign that even these companies, Google and Meta, will begin to weaken in the next few quarters. We go back to the wall of worry. What about the no deal thing? The Jerome Powell with the no deal. Is that even relevant anymore? Yes, it is. We got Friday's payrolls coming out. What if they came out hot, hot, hot? Indicating that not even the 25 basis points will happen in September. The economy is not weak enough, at least based on the data, for the Fed to cut rates at this point. You think the market will be happy about that? No, it's not. Because the market wants both cakes to be alive and if the jobs report comes out really hot it takes one cake away at least for the moment and that's gonna upset the market and lastly in the wall of worry we got the bank of japan what's going on here with the bank of japan i think that's going to become more relevant after the fed cuts rates because when the fed cuts rates they're going to devalue the dollar as the dollar is devalued the yen will appreciate in value. As the yen appreciates in value, more and more margin calls will hit the U.S. stock market, specifically in the largest cap stocks, the technology stocks. If you don't believe me, look at the Japanese yen versus USD in candlesticks. And the chart in white is the NDX, the NASDAQ. You can see that once we've seen the Japanese yen rallying by about 14%, the Nasdaq went down by about 12.5%. And you see the correlation. As we've seen the Japanese yen moving higher, the Nasdaq traded down. In the last couple of days, we've seen the Japanese yen going down and the Nasdaq moving back up. Why? Because the dollar firmed up against the Japanese yen. Why did the dollar firm up? Hotter GDP than expectations? And hotter data in general. Whatever they gave us this week, the cooked data, was good enough to move the dollar higher. And it, it, it reduces the risk a little bit. But if the payrolls come out weak, and the dollar crashes again, and the Japanese yen is going to rebound big. And here we go, we're now talking about the margin risk once again. And oh, by the way, we see volatility in emerging market currencies moving higher again. So the movie's not over, the risk is not over, it is just in the back burner for now. And it could come back in a big way after the payrolls. All I got to say, folks, buckle up your seat belts. it's going to be an interesting ride this week. Now, folks, this has been a long conversation so far. I don't want to waste your time a lot this uh, video and go talk about the market details one by one. All I want to do is just look at the market strategy that we have, then look at some important charts and what to look for in these charts, maybe two or three charts, and then wrap it up. Now, last week, we talked about this strategy. that we're going to stay along the SPYV, that's value. We're going to stay along the IWS, mid-cap value, dividend-paying stocks, the risk-off rotation, aka defensive, and we're going to stay along gold. We're going to rent from time to time oil, copper, the IWM small caps, KRE regional banks, the risk on rotation like the profitless companies, the cyclical names. But we're going to sell slash short the big caps and chips. Here's the scoreboard for the week. You can see that the SPYV, SPY value, up 1.45%. And I know a lot of you will say, what about the RSP? What about VTV? 
can I do that instead? The answer is yes. And if we go back to the beginning of the year, you will see the VTVs at performing SPYV, so VTV in white, SPYV value in blue. VTV, by the way, is also value, but it's from Vanguard. And then you have in yellow, RSP, which is the equal weight S&P 500. My preference is SPYV number one, then VTV, then RSP. And the reason is VTV is flawed in the fact that it has some uh, chip components. Matter of fact, the highest weighting is AVGO Broadcom. They consider that as value. I say it's in a bubble. And if it goes down along with the rest of them, it's going to hurt the VTV. It is outperforming right now because AVGO has been a hot stock. What if it stops being hot? Now, the problem with the RSP is it's not really giving you value. It's just giving you an equal weight for everything. So it still has the risk of NVIDIA going down, of Apple, if the big caps go down, the RSP will underperform too. So for me, I'm going to stick with the SPYV. The IWS was up about 7 tenths of a percent. Dividend paying stocks, let's look at DVY. That's the ETF for dividend paying stocks, up 1.37%. Now we have the risk on rotation, meaning defensives. We'll use the XLU utilities as an example. For the week, up 1.15 percent but then he got gold down a tick uh, 0.32 percent nothing big here now what is the problem that we see with these names staying long these names right now there is a major challenge and it ties in with the payrolls if we continue to see bond yields going higher let's say the 10-year crossing above four percent again and the dollar moving higher even more at some point it's going to impact these stocks negatively we will see a rotation the question of course becomes rotation from value dividend paying stocks defensives to where risk on the big caps or the dumpster and that's a long conversation that we're going to have but i think that the obvious uh, risk that we have here for this cohort of stocks if the payrolls come out really hot then bond yields are going to spike higher and dividend stocks, value stocks, not going to be in favor anymore. We'll see money coming out of them and rotating somewhere, depending on the interpretation of the data. We'll talk about that during the week. But right now, you look at dividend paying stocks like the DVY, this is the ETF for dividend paying stocks in white. And we go back, let's say, since the problem began in uh, mid-July or so. The DVY, dividend paying stocks, at performing even the SPYV value stocks in yellow certainly outperforming the SPY in green, and of course outperforming the Qs, the NASDAQ, which is the only negative index that you see here in that period of time. Now, I'm a fan of picking stocks. I don't like uh, the ETF investing. Sometimes it makes sense, but a lot of times it's just lazy investing. So I'm not long the DVY. I'd rather pick individual stocks. For example, plugging Coca-Cola in red. That's outperforming everything. Coca-Cola is outperforming the dividend ETF, the value ETF, the SPY, and the Qs. And if you thought that's crazy, plug in AppV. Big Pharma name, paying high dividend, that's in blue, and you see that that's outperforming everything. It's up about 17.5%. Outperforming Coke, dividend paying stocks, value, the S&P, and the Qs, the NASDAQ. But here's the problem. These names went way too high too fast and they're overextended right now. Here's the chart of AbV, massive rally. But is it stalling at this point? I think so. I think if yields go higher, bond yields that is, stocks like AbV going to pull back. What is the strategy if you've been long AbV? You sell covered calls, you buy some puts as protection. And that's called the collar strategy. It protects your gains. The only downside risk is if it continues to go higher, you're going to be obligated to sell your stock at a profit. Maybe it is time to sell it at a profit. So again, it's pretty much a risk-free strategy. It gives you a, a protection and a way to lock your gains. And the same thing is happening in Coca-Cola. You look at the stock here, daily chart, absolutely absurd. Massive rally, overextended, outside of the upper Bollinger Bands, RSI to the moon. It's gonna pull back. And the only reason why I see it's gonna pull back would be a hotter payrolls, a rally in bond yields. Whatever the reason is, anything that spike yields higher would bring Coke in a pullback. What is the strategy again? You sell covered calls, you buy the puts, collar strategy, you protect, you lock in the gains. And oh, by the way, for folks who are going to say, but Maverick, you, don't, you never tell us what to buy. You always talk about doom and gloom. Yes, I do give you what to buy, but you're not paying attention because you're too lazy to do so. Let's go back to my Discord morning brief, dated July 17th. I gave you the strategy before the whole show began. I said Coca-Cola and many other names, by the way, but Coke. I said been consolidating for a while. I think it will release its energy to the upside once it closes above 64.35. And I gave you this chart right here. And now the stack is trading north of 72. In any case, let's go back to the strategy board. 
So we talked about longs, how to manage them, what to do right now, what kind of risk you have to look forward to. What about the scoreboard for the rent category? So when we look at oil, USO was down about 1.6%. Of course, the majority of the drop happened Friday because we probably got a fugazi piece of news from Reuters. And Reuters say that perhaps OPEC Plus will increase production. They've done it before. I mean, Reuters spreading the false rumor. And that's why the Saudi prince, for example, doesn't take questions from Reuters because they're famous for fake news. In any case, the damage is already done. Oil went down big on Friday. OPEC has yet to come out and deny the report. Until they do, oil was down about 1.6%. At least in the USO, this is the mechanism we replay oil with. Copper down 2.38%. The IWM small caps down about 0.14%, almost flattish. The KRE regional banks up about 7 tenths of a percent. We're going to stake long KRE for now. And then you got risk on rotation. We'll use buzz, the ticker buzz, as a representative of the risk on rotation. That's down 1.55% for the week. Then you look at the cyclicals, but it's a mixed picture. If you look at airliners, jets, the ticker jets is the ETF for airliners, up 1.6% for the week. You look at the XRT retail, that's down 2.2% for the week. Why? Because of Lululemon, Alta Beauty, Dollar General. So again, I'm not a fan of buying the ETFs. I'm a fan of picking individual stocks. And that's what I did when I picked Delta, for example, not the ETF Jets. So pick the individual names that you like. This is the beauty of the period that we have right now in the stock market. It's a stock picker kind of environment. The lazy dog shit environment of buying just the ETFs, the lazy investing, uh, that's taking a pause right now. It might come back at some point if the big caps see a rotation. But right now it's a stack picker environment. And I love that. You look at a name like Marriott was up about 2.19% for the week. Uh, you look at the sell strategy. Oh, by the way, what is the risk here for the rent category? Well, the risk is if the jobs number comes out really weak. Then we're going to talk about recession risk. And if you have a recession risk, then you can't be long oil. You can't be long copper. Certainly not the small caps or regional banks or the profitless companies or even the cyclicals. And now we begin to appreciate how important Friday's number would be. What about the sell category? So we talked about big caps and you see the XLK, the ETF for big cap technology stocks down 0.1.62%. We talked about chips, the SMH, the ETF for chips down about 2% for the week. So we got the strategy pretty much spot on, but you got to look for what's going to happen from this point on. Could it be a rotation back into the big caps and the chips? That is a possibility. If say we, we go back to the same dynamics of all, oh, we have an inflationary jobs report. The dollar and bond yields are rallying higher by too much where it makes the IWM and the risk on rotation not as attractive as the safety of cash generating stocks, such as the big cap technology stocks and the chip stocks, mostly in Video. And the other caveat you need to pay attention to here, even within the chips category, they're not created equal. And again, I love the stock picking environment here. So for example, uh, you have a bunch of chip stocks here. In yellow, you got Texas, which is considered value. In the last couple of weeks, Texas is up about seven and three quarters of a percent. You look at Intel in white, up about a little over four and a half percent. The majority of the gains happened in the last couple of days because of the rumor or the news that we could see something happening with Intel. I'd say be careful. Intel is a heartbreaker. It never ceases to disappoint. And then you have in, uh, what is it, pink? You have the SMH, the chip ETF, that's down about 2%. You got NVIDIA in green, that's down about six and a quarter percent. You got AMD in red, that's down about six and a half percent. Then you have in blue, the laggard, Micron, that's down almost 10.5%. So again, huge contrast between NVIDIA, Micron, AMD, and then Texas, Intel, which is considered as value chips. That's an important take, folks. The market is trying to say something here, that it appreciates value more. But as I said before in this program, the payrolls and how it impacts the dollar and bond yields could change the game this week. Now, before we wrap it up right here, let's do some of the important charts for the indices and then wrap it up. Let's begin with the SPY, the S&P 500, an hourly chart. What do we see here? It's been just consolidating for about two weeks now, doing nothing at all. The important line of support in the intraday chart is the 555 line. It hasn't been violated so far. Furthermore, you look at the consolidation that we've been getting, let's say in the last week or so, then you look at the bearish momentum in the MACD indicator in the hourly chart. Every time I see bearish momentum playing out via consolidation, usually 
Let's say 9 times out of 10. It is a process of gathering the energy to release that energy to the upside. Let's brainstorm why would that happen? Why would the S&P 500 rally and we see the release of energy? The only reason I can think of is a rotation back to the big caps and the chip components. Well, gee, how would that happen? If we see the dollar and bond yields going higher from this point on, and that prompts a rotation out of value, out of dividend paying stocks, back into the big caps and the AI mania. Appreciate the generation of cash, not dividend. But one step at a time. When we look at the daily chart for the SPY, what do we see here? Right off the gate, we see the possibility of a bull flag playing out, and we see a rally to the highs, as the hourly chart perhaps suggests. What will be the confirmation, though? Well, closing above the previous high, 565.16, that will be the green light. It'd be a no-brainer buy. What is the bearish confirmation, though? What if the action that we got this week is misleading because of low volume, and as volume comes back in the month of September, we see a different reaction. Well, the confirmation will be taking 554.73, on the daily chart, there'll be a confirmation that you should be short the SPY at least all the way down to the 20 days moving average. That's going to be in or around 547.41. Looking at the weekly chart for the SPY, a big rebound so far. We're back almost at the highs right now. But did it change anything when it comes to the weekly momentum? The answer is not a lot. We are still in negative divergences in both the MACD and the RSI. And as I said before, the James Bond thingy, there is no time to die. This rebound cannot die before it makes a new high. And we're talking for the week. Any failure at this point will either create an inverse ABC pattern in the case of the NASDAQ or a double top in the case of the SPY. There is no time to die. The chart has to continue to go higher until it closes above the previous high for the week. Otherwise, we're not out of the woods. Looking at the Q's hourly chart, a little weaker than the SPY, but it did not violate the important number, 469. So let's say that we wake up Monday or Tuesday, we lose 469, lose meaning closing the day or at least the hour since we're looking at the hourly chart, below 469. then that's going to be a confirmation that something else is going on, and down we go. Because right now, as we said with the SPY, consolidation pattern, while the hourly MACD plays a reversal from bullish to bearish. The next stage would be a reversal from bearish to bullish, releasing all of this energy from the consolidation. Why would that happen? The big caps, but specifically NVIDIA rallying. How would the big caps and NVIDIA rally? A move higher in the dollar and bond yields. That prompt a rotation out of the dividend paying stocks and value stocks. It all ties in, folks. Now, when we look at the daily chart for the Qs, right off the gate, we can see the possibility of a bull flag and a move higher. Uh, do you chase it right now? I think it's too risky because what if the action that we got in the last few days is a fugazi? It's a product of low volume. And as the volume comes back in September, we see the opposite. So your confirmation that this is indeed a consolidation in a bull flag and higher we go would be close above 485.54. Where is your bearish confirmation? Another close, daily close below the 50 days moving average. We did that once and we fixed it. Question is, was it a false fix because of options expiration or low volume or the end of the month shenanigans by the asset managers? And they gave us a false signal. This is why Monday's activities, even though we're probably going to be in anticipation of the payrolls Friday. But Monday's close will be important. If it is a close below the 50 days moving average, there is big risk that Friday's activities could have been misleading. And in reality, what the Qs is doing is forming a lower high. The next step will be forming a lower low. Now, another minor confirmation line on the bullish side, at least, even the bearish, will be the sloping line of resistance. Meaning, if we go all the way up there and then fail and then cut below the 50, oh, that's going to be a massive confirmation that down we go. If we go to the sloping line and we cut above, then we have to wait for the confirmation of 485.54. But closing above the sloping line will increase the odds that the Qs will make it above the important number 485.54. What is the confirmation line of the NASDAQ futures, though? Because that's also perhaps more important than the Qs. If you look at the daily chart, closing above the 50, bullish confirmation. It appears that we have this right now, but the session is still young. The closing on Friday was below the 50 days moving average in the NASDAQ futures chart. The bearish confirmation will be taken out the 20 days moving average, which you can see right now in white. We have a closing below, got a bearish confirmation. And here's the last chart we're going to cover for this program. How about NVIDIA? Here's the hourly chart. We talked about two confirmation layers, 120 and 117. Losing 120 is a warning sign, but it's not a confirmation of anything. 
not a biggie. Losing 117 is a biggie. Losing 117 would be a bearish confirmation for everybody who's short. Right now, we're above 117. The problem is if we lose 117, then you go back to the daily chart. It'll be a confirmation that NVIDIA cannot make it above the 50 days moving average in blue. It'd be a confirmation that when you look at the daily MACD, NVIDIA is indeed reversing from bullish to bearish. So 117 is a critical line. Now, we're already below the 50, 120, but losing 117 would be a confirmation that we're going to stay below the 50. And with that, folks, let's segue to the conclusion of this video. What do we have on the economic calendar this week? Happy Labor Day, nothing going on today. Tomorrow, Tuesday the 3rd, we have the manufacturing PMI. It comes with the ISM manufacturing data. That comes, of course, on top of construction spending. All important, but uh, any anomaly will be dismissed as, okay, it is important, but is it really more important than the payrolls? So the payrolls will overshadow everything, but these are all important pieces of data. Wednesday, September 4th, we have the trade deficit, jobs openings, factory orders, the Fed beige book, and auto sales, TBD. Then we have Thursday the 5th, ADP employment for the private payrolls. Some would say a leading indicator to the uh, kitchen data, but uh, the correlation been uh, way off recently. Then we got initial jobless claims. We got US productivity revision. We got the services PMI and ISM services, important piece of data. And we're gonna conclude the week here, folks, with Friday, September 6th, the employment report. And that's gonna be the last piece of input, at least important piece of input, because CPI, PPI, I mean, that's not a source of concern right now. But that's gonna be the last piece of input that the Fed needs before making the decision for September. What do we have in the earnings calendar for the week? We have Broadcom, an important chip component, AI component. We have Oracle, also an important AI component. We have important consumer indicators like Kroger and Dick's Sporting Good, Dollar Tree and Hormel Foods. So it is an important week from an earnings perspective too, not as important as the previous few weeks, but to say the least, it is important. Are we gonna be active here, folks, covering it all? Day by day, we gotta wrap it up right here. If you enjoyed the show, you found it informative and helpful, please return the favor by pressing the like button, leaving a nice comment, subscribing to the channel, and better yet, join us as a member here on YouTube or Patreon. The links in the description. You will access the daily show, plus bonus videos, and the Discord benefits. But folks, this is all I got for you for tonight. Thank you for listening, thank you for watching, appreciate all of you, and I will talk to you again tomorrow. Good night. All right, everybody. That's the end of the day. Thank you very much. Your graded papers are down here at the end. You can pick them up on your way out.